You are listening to the Bravo Creative Podcast, hosted by Tom Baker. Thank you for listening. Your position has been triangulated. Drone army has been dispatched to your location. Commencing attack run in 3, 2, 1. Hello and welcome to the Bravo Creative Podcast. I'm so very happy to have you listening today. Today's podcast is brought to you by humbleness. Being in a very egocentric headspace that we're in, filming, acting, performing, and putting it all out there, being humble is a very difficult thing to get to mentally. And I know that it's extremely hard for me, but I'm working at it. And I pride myself in knowing a lot of things about this creative headspace and doing this podcast and being fortunate to be able to have conversations with some very talented individuals. I have naturally become very humble at what I don't know. And uh, it's my belief that as we get older, we realize how much we are not in the know and not as in control as we think we are. And also, and most importantly, when we humble ourselves and ask for help, the reward of that perspective and that interaction, that new connection is so very valuable and really just a lot of fun. And it's a great experience. So humble thyself, ask for help and reap the benefits. The Bravo Creative Podcast is being transmitted to you by all your favorite podcasty platforms out there, such as Podbean, Google Podcasts, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Amazon Prime Music, Audible, YouTube, and it's shared out on our Facebook page, The Bravo Creative Podcast, and it's linked directly at www.bravocreative.net slash bravo podcast. And if you're liking what I'm cooking here, make sure you like and share, send a message, give me a call. They are all very much appreciated. And uh, I want to give a shout out today real quick, just because I can. I want to thank one of my MVP sharers out there that has made a point to promote the podcast for me. And it just warms my heart every time she does it. Brittany Greer, who was a guest on the podcast, has always been great at sharing the podcast out. And uh, she was, like I said, she was a guest on the show. Uh, If you haven't listened to that episode, make sure you go back and listen to it. And I want to remind my listeners that Brittany is currently in the funding stage for her film, Happy Halloween, which sounds like a great project. The proof of concept uh, was very intriguing. It looked beautiful and it was shot by uh, another one of our guests, David Watson, So drop them a few dollars or drop them a bunch of dollars to get that project going. And that website is www.indiegogo.com slash projects slash happy dash Halloween. And I donated to the project and you should too. They're a very talented group of folks working on it. My guest today, once I met him, I wanted to have him on the show, and I had the pleasure of working with him on a project a few months ago. It was the first time I'd ever met him, and I was immediately impressed with his filmmaking process and prowess and professionalism and just the wealth of knowledge that he possessed in the realm of filmmaking, and he just kind of exudes it, and he has, a, he has a confidence. At least that's what it seemed like to me when we were on set. Now, uh, after the fact, after I've talked to him, he uh, revealed that he wasn't very confident and it was he's really good at acting. And uh, he was a lot of fun to have on set. He made the process so much easier uh, for me as an actor because I felt very confident in what he was doing. He's a very busy man, so I'm super glad that he took the time out today to come in and talk with me. I think he's got to run on another project as soon as he finishes here, but I want to welcome to the microphone, the busy, the magical, the funny Sam Holder. (laughs) How are you doing, Sam? Yeah, I don't, I don't know how to follow that up. Uh, <laughs> those were all lies. So thanks for telling great not lies. At all. Thanks for not being at a all. great storyteller. <laughs> um, I'm fantastic, and I'm, I'm really glad to be here, and uh, I'm excited to be 
<clears throat> to be on this podcast. I listened to it uh, since the very beginning, and uh, and it's really awesome to hear all the stuff that's going on in Springfield and the surrounding areas that uh, up until your podcast, I had no clue was going on for that's the most crazy. part. So yeah, yeah. Can, well, you de- you- can you deepen my voice? Can I sound a little... I'm just kidding. <laughs> It's terrifying. <laughs> Sorry. Well, I, I wanna I wanna share a story. So this was probably this was what two or three weeks ago that you reached out to me. You would you were driving back and forth from St. Louis and you were listening to the podcast mm-hmm. and Sam messaged me and you just messaged me and said, Hey, I'm loving the podcast yep. and, and all that. Well what was funny is I was downstairs. Um I'm going through this like whole shift of my camera gear. Mm-hmm. Um I've decided to kind of change my gear. I want to go to a different realm. And I thought, you know, I need to, I need to kind of upgrade. So I've been going back and forth on gear and just banging my head on the wall. Like what camera to get, what lens to get, blah, 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 blah. Anyways, I was talking to my wife downstairs and she was like, was there anybody you can call just to kind of give you a, you know, uh, a different opinion, you know, that you, and I, you know, I was sitting there and I was like, you know, I've been wanting to call Sam Holder (laughs) because you use a little different rig than Mm -hmm. everybody else does around here. Mm -hmm. You're kind of not the Sony fanboy or the black magic fanboy. And you kind of went this different route. And I thought, you know what? That's a great perspective to kind of put in to my, so I humbled myself and I thought, (laughs) you know, I'm going to give Sam a call. Well, you texted me like within, I don't know, a couple minutes. I was almost like it was fortuitous. And I was like, oh, Sam. And so I, I think I told you, I said, I was just talking about you. Yeah, yeah. And so then we got on the phone, we started talking and then I ultimately dropped the bo- uh, bomb and I was like, Hey, I want you on a podcast. And so here we are. Yeah. But we talked for quite a while about like a half an hour about <laughs> gear. Yeah, yeah. Which was a lot of fun. Yeah. So what have you been working on? Cause you, you've been kind of all over the place here lately. Yeah. So, um, Let's see. What have I been working on? I always hate that question. What have you been working on? Because I uh, failed to... Yeah, no. I mean, it's it's always just like, okay, well, um, I've got this tomorrow and I've got this the next day. So it's a lot of uh, it's a lot of run and gun kind of stuff, but not a whole lot of chance to like stop and smell the roses kind of thing. So um, I have a client, a few clients here in Springfield, like I said, that uh, that keep me very busy, um, very regularly, um, a church and then um, a pretty good uh, food service uh, company. And yeah, so. Um, and when you do film for that kind of stuff, are you yeah. doing just commercial pieces or is it internal stuff that you're doing? For a lot them? of it is internal. Um, some of it is, uh, you know, like Instagram, YouTube stuff. Yeah. And then I end up, uh, I hate it, but I'm essentially a one man band on a lot of that stuff just because, yeah. you know, it's not worth it to hire an audio person financially, you know, it's not right. worth it financially to hire an audio person and a grip and that sort of thing. I'd love to, I, I think I'm almost to that point now where I need just a second person on set to, to help me with stuff. So, yeah. um, we're getting, I'm getting close there. It does make it a little bit easier. Mm-hmm. Um, the run and gun stuff is fun at, on some projects, but it would be nice sometimes just to have another person that's like looking and paying attention to other things. Definitely. Um, because you kind of have to be all in and focused on that story, mm-hmm. you know, whatever you're trying to tell. Yeah. Um, and when I say run and gun, it's not like I'm, you know, ENG shooting, you know, stuff, you right. know, I'm not, uh, it's, I mean, it's still carefully placed stuff and, uh, lit and all that stuff, but it's, uh, it's moving so fast in the sense that <laughs> I don't have time to stop and think about stuff. Right. Uh, what, what camera are you using? Number one. Yeah. Um, so, um, a few years ago, uh, I made the switch over to the Panasonic Evo one and it's, it's one of those cameras that did not get great fanfare. I know that you and Tim were talking about that, and uh, and a lot of people snubbed it because, you know, it didn't have a proper viewfinder. It didn't come with a monitor. You know, it was essentially a box. And I had already rigged out gears in the or rigged out cameras in the past, and so I just brought all that rigging gear to this camera, and it's a very usable camera for me. It's very natural colors. I was coming from Sony colors, and. And I think sometimes it's a cop out to say, oh, I don't like the color science of X or Y camera, I you agree. know, because some of that can be fixed in post. But a lot of times. Or set your white balance correctly. Well, I mean, <laughs> but coming from Sony, 
I was finding myself ashamed to hand the footage off to the client because I was so disappointed with what I was seeing. And so when I made the switch over and, and not to say that, you know, people can't make Sony stuff look great because there are plenty of people in town that do, but I wanted to be able to, I wanted to be confident enough to record something in camera and just hand it off to somebody and, right. and know that what I'm giving them is exactly what I want. Um, to give them. And so um, when the Evo one came out, I was kind of one of the first people I knew to purchase something like that. And, uh, um, and that's super 35, right? Super 35 sensor. Yeah. And uh, you know, it, I needed XLR inputs and I needed uh, built in NDs. And so it had that. And then it, um, um, I had worked with Vericam way in the past, Panasonic Vericam stuff way in the past, back when it was a tape based format and loved variable frame rates and all that stuff. And I, and now every camera does that. I mean, right. our phones, <laughs> <laughs> my, my smartphone shoots 240 frames a second. That's right. insane. It's more than your camera, exactly. your, you know, yeah. $10,000 um, camera does. Definitely. Um, and you know, from the initial, um, you know, first, first couple firmware versions of that camera, it was, it was not great. Um, it was a little clunky. It, it was seemed like clunky. at the very beginning, Yeah, and, which Panasonic, kind of runs the risk of doing that. Like I, you know, I shoot with a GH five and mm -hmm. I have shot with a GH five for a long time. Mm -hmm. I actually started my business with a GH four. Okay. No, yeah. I started my business with a, was it a GX two, a little teensy tiny camera. Yeah. And it was micro four thirds. And I started out doing just little web videos in the, the town that I grew up in and started making a living with it. Yeah. And then I was like, Oh, GH five came out and I was going nuts. But, and I've always been a little critical of Panasonic's color. Uh, it has a tendency to be a little too flat for me sometimes, you know, when you go in and like grade it or whatever. Yeah. Their autofocus on like the GH5 and the GH4 is always kind of run, giving them a, a lot of bad press because of their right. autofocus. But I mean, I don't really use <laughs> autofocus too much it's such a silly argument i think when i see people say oh the autofocus on this camera system sucks well yeah okay yeah so focus it yeah yourself <laughs> you know and i understand Turn i understand it, yeah. how awesome it is you know to have auto autofocus on, on on a gimbal or, or that sort of thing right um but uh i mean so do you run yeah. any of that your um your cameras on a gimbal i do i ha so i have a um I have a Panasonic S1H, which I purchased oh, because right. it was uh, right. similar color science. They said it was the same color science, but it's not. <laughs> uh, similar color science. Uh, and uh, and I, I run it on an RS2, a uh, Ronin RS2. Oh, okay. I hate, I hate gimbals. I really do. Like, it's, it's one of those I things. I have a love-hate with yeah. them. I, yeah. I really do have a love-hate with them. I hate buying them. Um, that's why I like that GH five because I've actually, I've filmed quite a few commercials mm -hmm. handheld with that mm -hmm. GH five and I, I kind of like the shake a little bit in it yeah. and it smooths a lot of it out anyways, you know, yep. just handheld in it. Their Ibis on those is just awesome. That's pretty awesome. Yeah. For me, I mean, for me, a gimbal is like a fisheye lens. You want to use it when you need to use it, but it's not for every shot and you know, unless you have somebody that has a tremendously amazing creative vision that says, "Hey, let's do this with a camera," um, I don't like to. I don't like to use it. <laughs> you know, put it on sticks. Yeah, yeah. And there are <laughs> there are people that are spectacular in this town with with uh, with their gimbalosity. Yeah, gimbal. That's a good. I like that <laughs> gimbalosity. <you>. Yeah. Um, <laughs> And, and, you know, I mean, I think if I had more time to practice, I think I'd probably hate it less, but. Well, and I think I said on the pack podcast last week, I think one of the big things with a gimbal is that, and it's, I've always been okay with it because, um, I think a big part of camera, you know, moving a camera is the rehearsal of it. Mm -hmm. It's going through and going through those steps and being an actor, as well, I realize the importance of rehearsing my movements. Definitely. And I think as a camera operator, especially if you have a gimbal, or if you're doing a shoulder mount work or whatever, it's going through and it's memorizing and building that muscle memory into that movement. I think it, it helps a lot in the end by doing it that way. Definitely. And I mean, even um, I can now say a decade ago 
or more than a decade ago when I was in California, um, you know, the same thing happened with Steadicam operators. You'd, you'd hire a Steadicam operator for the day, and then he would essentially be a moving tripod because we had this incredible camera movement possibility, but nobody really knew how to utilize that. And so, and I struggle with that, like I said, with the gimbal. Um, so I don't know, I guess that's an area of personal growth in the next or <laughs> professional growth within the next you know, couple of years. Talking about our five year plan. Yeah. Right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, definitely. So how did you get into, um, filmmaking? Like did, was that a, a process that started early on yes. in life for you? Yes. I knew, um, let's see. My parents bought uh, bought a VHS camera when I was six, maybe. Oh, wow. And I remember going to the electronics store and my parents purchasing it. And I said, I, I will play with that camera. I will play with it. <laughs> um, from that day on, like I knew that's, that's what I wanted to do. And I'd always thought like... I mean, when I was two or three or four, like my favorite toys were like microphones and radios and stuff. And I thought I'd do the radio thing when I was three or four. <laughs> I know that sounds silly, but I've always known what I wanted to do. Um, I come from a very artistic background family. My dad was uh, a drama teacher for high schools and did the high school musicals every summer and did the set design for that and oh, helped direct cool. it. Yeah. And so um, I luckily had the, the, push from my parents to, um, to do what I do, what, do what I'm passionate about. Um, and I mean, I, I put, I put thousands more hours on that camera than my parents ever did, you know? <laughs> oh yeah. They recorded all the, you know, all the, you know, high school stuff that I did and all that stuff. But I was, I was making stuff with it constantly. So, so did you dabble in acting then? No, not at all. No. Oh, well, I mean, I did like stage stuff. I did a couple, uh, you know, stage plays cause my dad was, so what you was know. your biggest stage play role that you had? Um, let's see. I was a meal in South Pacific. Oh, yeah, cool. Yeah, terrible French accent. Don't ever ask me to do a French <laughs> accent ever again. Um, Pirates of Penzance. Um, I forget what I played in that. Oh, you're doing the classics. Yeah. Man. Um, and then I did, um, your good man, Charlie Brown. I think I was Linus. Me and Charlie Brown. Um, and we did theater in the round on that. Is that the one where, uh, Poor Sweet Baby? Is that know. in Good Man Charlie Brown? I don't know. It's poor been a long time. Poor Sweet Baby. Maybe. I think Lucy sings it mm. to uh, Charlie. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, yeah. Mm -hmm. I think that rings a bell. That rings a bell. So. I had a girlfriend uh, that used to sing that song to me. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> Thank God it wasn't awesome. my wife that sang yeah. it. Yeah. 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 <laughs> so. <laughs> but yeah, I, uh, that's cool though that you, I mean, so you have a little bit of grounding. You at least know, um, from the filmmaking standpoint, you kind of know that dramatic side or you're, you're comfortable with that dramatic side then. Maybe. Yeah. Um, and I, I don't know. I mean, I think I learned a lot more after going to school and that sort of thing on that. Um, you know, then, then growing up in theater, Really. So wh now, where did you grow up at? So I grew up in Pueblo, Colorado. Um, oh wow! Yeah, it's uh, it's a town in Southern Colorado. People go, oh, you're from Colorado. Oh, yeah, no, not the skiing part. I, I was just in... drove through Pueblo. Did you really? Like, uh, was that in August or September? Yeah. Okay. My wife and I, we went out to Arizona. It was too hot. Oh yeah. <laughs> and so we drove up to Colorado, and we went to. I can't remember the name of the place. It was up in the mountains, but then we came down through and came out in Pueblo. It's kind of yeah. on the plain, isn't it? Yeah. yeah it's yeah. a, it's prairies. Um, we actually me... stopped and ate in Pueblo. Okay. Yeah. Down the little square down there. Oh yeah. We ate in Pueblo. Yeah. 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 It, uh, it's taken me about 30, 30 years to realize the beauty of Brown Prairie. Yeah. Um, but it's, it's a gorgeous, it's a gorgeous part of the country. It's just perspective. Yeah. Right. Totally. <laughs> totally. Um, yeah, so I did that and, uh, um, uh, did a lot of tape to tape VHS, uh, editing in high school. Wasn't that fun? Yeah. No, <laughs> not at all. Uh, we did like in camera editing. Mm -hmm. That's so the best though. If that take sucked, we rewound it and we tried to cut it just right so that we could get right back onto the next one. That's awesome. 
And we did that forever. Yeah. Because I, I kind of have the same story that mm-hmm. you do as far as like filming early on is my, there was a guy in our church, he had bought a VHS camera mm-hmm. and he, he was a single guy and he was like, Hey, you guys want to go make some movies? And we were like, okay, yeah. <laughs> and so we did, we just come up with these on the fly little skits or yeah. whatever. Yeah. And then, um, he needed some cash one, one month and he said, Hey, I'm going to sell this video camera. And I went to my dad. I said, "Hey, Dad, can we buy this? Because we still really want to make films and awesome. stuff." And my dad was like, "Yeah, you can. We'll buy it." He goes, "We'll use it for the family, but then you know, you guys can make your films." Cool. And so we did. We made like kung fu films all the time. Yeah. And army films, army kung fu, uh, Monty Python films. Those were always like <laughs> that was kind of our that was our fallback. Was yeah. doing those. <laughs> and I wish I could find them. I don't have. I can't find hardly any of oh, mine. Man. And then I did stop animation stuff, Mm -hmm. which was super hard on those because you had to push the button really fast to get one frame, Mm -hmm. (laughs) which doesn't work. No. I've I've since gone back and edited some of those and like taken frames out so that it could, and it plays pretty good. Awesome. Yeah. That's what, that was my beginnings too. And I have a, is a warm place in my heart for making films when you're a kid because it just really invigorated me. To wanting to do it more when I got older. Yeah, yeah. I I kind of had more of that during school, like in in uh, in college, uh, you know, because they would just hand us a camera, and they would say make something, and I really miss that because now, um, and I don't want to sound like a money hungry person. I mean, I'm I'm supporting my family doing what I do, um, but now I don't I don't pick up a camera unless it means work for me yeah. and I really I really very much miss the creative side of just picking up a camera and doing something cool yeah you know I so. agree that's actually something that kind of um I guess the pandemic last year really refocused me and got me yeah. thinking about it. I mean I think I made like I think I made like five or six little short films last year awesome And it was fun. It was a ton of fun. One day I I went out and filmed something because I didn't know what to do. I got a new anamorphic lens, (laughs) one of those little Siri U 50 mils. And I thought, I want to go make something. Yeah. I just want to go. And so it had rained and I stood outside for a little bit and said, what am I, I'm just going to get some pictures of the water going down the street, you know? And so I found a clover and I dropped it in. And so I did a story of, it getting to its final destination, which was a big roaring waterfall that comes off into this lake. And it was like telling a story and I wound up getting a whole bunch of people view it. Awesome. And I met this guy from England and he wanted to score it. And so he scored it. And that to me, that's what that that's the, that's kind of the, the joy of filmmaking is that it really does bridge those connections with people. Mm -hmm. You make friends uh, you filmed uh, Land of Milk and Honey. You were the the director of photography on that, and it's just it's a fun experience. Definitely, like the the connections that you make, and you really all are in the trenches in your own mind, and you're all on your own little islands because we all think we're not good enough, and then we all get together and we find out that we're all actually pretty good in our own little <laughs> area, and out of that you kind of make friends yeah really easily and you make really good like lasting friendships mm-hmm. because you've um you've exposed your your vulnerabilities definitely I guess. yeah totally and that was something that interested me and i want to get back and talk about like education and all that stuff yeah. but you said something that was really interesting to me and i did mention it in last week's podcast, I didn't mention your name because I didn't know <laughs> if that was something that I you was wondering were, if that was what you were, yeah, if you were talking about. Me. But I want you to talk about this because yeah. this really, uh, actually, uh, David Watson was here last night. Me yeah. and him were talking about a project, and uh, Aline O'Neill, uh, we were all talking about some stuff, and um, and it's something that is very interesting to me because I've gone through it. I know David's kind of gone through it. And when I talked with you, you said you had gone through it where you wanted, like you were getting ready to film something and it was that over, 
that undeniable sense of, I don't want to do this because it's all going to come crashing down. Is that, is that kind of accurate? Yeah, I think to a certain extent. Yeah. Um, so, you know, when I, when I got called on for uh, land of milk and honey, I was, I was interested in, you know, I was very interested in the project and interested in the story behind it and um, excited to, to work with a bunch of actors and of course excited to shoot a movie in, in Springfield. Um, I've been lucky enough to work on um, a, a handful of uh, large movies that have come through, or large, I say large, it's, um, you know, a million dollars or less budget movies that have come through. And, and so like, I love the opportunity to 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 work on movies here in in, in Southwest Missouri because it's a beautiful place and it's it's versatile and you can shoot anything here, except for a mountain movie. You can't shoot a mountain movie. Here. <laughs> you can shoot hill movies yeah. here. Yeah, <laughs> uh, but uh, um, I don't know. As as we got closer and closer to the shoot date, you know, I started to started to second guess myself and started to question. Okay, well, am I? am I cut out to do this? Uh, and obviously I've, you know, I have training. I, I went to school for film, um, and I've worked on a, a, quite a few movies and, and so I know how it's supposed to go. And, and, um, but in my head, I'm like, I'm not, I'm not ready to do this. I'm not capable of doing this. And I'm not a very good delegator of things. So having a crew of people underneath me brings even more anxiety to, to me quite a bit. And so, you know, in the days leading up to it, I'm like, it's sometimes it's more work to delegate than it is just to do it yourself. Exactly. Oh my gosh. <laughs> it overcomplicates yeah. it in your mind sometimes. Definitely. And I mean, being a one man band on a lot of projects, I'm like, well, I'll just do this myself. I know right. what I'm doing, you know? And so, <laughs> so up until, you know, the very, the, the couple days beforehand, I'm like, oh, I, I really hope this project doesn't go through. I really hope it cancels. I hope they lose their funding. I hope, you know, all this stuff. And then, you know, the first day rolls around and, and my wife pushes me out the door and she says, go do it. I mean, the first day was a wild success, I think. And yeah, it was awesome. Um, it was awesome. And, uh, and it's one of those things like, I don't know. It's well, it, and you said by the end of that first day, mm -hmm. you were like jazzed to do it the next day. Exactly. Cause you're like, after getting over that kind of hump of, insecurity yep. or self-doubt yep. or whatever. I mean, it does take it. You have to go, you kind of have to lay your ears back and just go in. But once you get through it and you get done, you're like, Oh, this is so much fun. Yeah. It's just like a roller coaster, yeah. you know, like that, that, uh, that long ride up to the top of the roller coaster. Mm -hmm. You're like, you're prepping yourself. Uh, and I'm not a huge roller coaster fan. Uh, and then that initial drop, it sucks. It's right. terrible, in my opinion. But the rest of the r the rest of the roller coaster ride is amazing. And, and then so, when you get done, you got a smile on your face. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And you want to yeah. do it again. Yeah. And um, and so and and you know, obviously the project was not without uh, a few problems. I I had you know just one of those bad days on one of our shoot days, and we started a little bit too late um, during the day, so I ran out of daylight and had to make daylight with you know not enough sources for daylight um that one re light that we had on there on set that the m18 was, is really cool man. yeah yeah it really did i mean i've i remember standing there in the doorway uh -huh. and i could feel the heat <laughs> off of that light <laughs> yeah all the way outside it was crazy yeah. yeah and if you i mean you know if you got 10 grand to spend on a light that's a good <laughs> light to get for sure you know um you know, it's one of those things that, uh, it's an heirloom piece that you'll right. pass on to your children. Uh, anyway, what you do know. you use this for? Well, yeah. <laughs> who knows? So, um, yeah, but, uh, I mean, it was full of challenges and full of a lot of stuff that I had to scratch my head on quite a bit, you know, and figure out. And, um, I want that opportunity again. Yeah. You know, I really do. Well, and you know, what was interesting about it? I, I don't know if I, forgive me if I've talked about it before, but, one of the things that really, really impressed me, um, because when I showed up on the first day of filming, we, we did, we had, um, we had a, uh, actress that had to uh, back out of the film, um, before, and we were actually getting ready to film. I got there and that scene was set up to film, Yeah, which I didn't want to do that scene. That was a horrible scene to do. Mm -hmm. Um, I was not. 
I felt very underprepared going yep. into that yep. day doing that scene. And so I got there and I, I was kind of feeling the same way that you were because, um, I, for the last few years, I've, I've typically spent most of my time behind the camera mm-hmm. and not in front of it. Mm-hmm. I do love being in front of the camera, <laughs> but being behind it was at that time was a lot easier for me. Yeah. And then whenever I got there that day and we, we adjusted and made it work and uh, I give my major props to 417 grip. Those guys were Mm -hmm. phenomenal and just fast how they could set up lights and just moving around and getting everything done. But it was like everything just kind of moved and uh, you guys seem like you knew what was going on, (laughs) you know, and we're I mean, good, for we're good actors, right? And for an actor, though, I sit there and look at it and go, okay, then I don't, I don't have to worry about nothing. I just need to stay in my own headspace and do what I need to do mm-hmm. so I don't mess this up. Yeah. You know? Yep. And, and props to you guys. Cause I mean, you guys really did a great job. Oh, uh, well, like, I appreciate and it. <laughs> I felt very confident. Like I, you know, it was cool. Cause I could go over there and look at the the screen and I could watch it and I was like, Oh, I love what he's doing here. I love the framing (laughs) that all made sense to me. And I loved Mm -hmm. it. I thought it was just so cool. And I just, (laughs) it was fun to be an observer in that sense, because I'm not usually observer. I'm usually a participant. Right. Yeah. And so it was kind of cool to sit back and look at all your gear (laughs) and look at your lenses, Yeah, which I bought. Yep. I bought both those lenses that you have. Uh, I can't wait to get them in. Yeah, those are those are cool lenses, and I had never worked with those lenses either. Those are actually, <laughs> yeah, no, they were. <laughs> those are actually, uh, um, um, four one seven grips. Oh, lenses. they are. Yeah. So, um, so, um, but uh, worked with them just a little bit beforehand, and I was like, oh, I kind of like what these are doing. They're really pretty and, lenses. Uh, I mean, and they're they are not. Uh, they're not clinically sharp. They are. They're they not, but I, that's what I but, think. I kind of yeah. like about yeah. them is that. I think cameras are a little too sharp nowadays, in well, my opinion. Yeah, and you look at, I mean, I was able to watch um, a screening of uh, Raiders of the Lost Ark a few years ago. Um, and you watch a movie like that on the big screen and you think, oh, this is a, you know, this is a perfect film. And you look at the edges and the edges are blurry, yeah. you know, and stuff. And, and uh, you know, if you look at any vintage lenses right now i mean none of them are sharp in all you know all over the place like they're the middle the mm-hmm. middle spot yeah. is and assuming that they have it set at like you know like nowadays we want to set everything at 2.8 and <laughs> cuz we want the bokeh you yeah. know <laughs> and that i mean you know it was like we were talking last night i mean like star wars was filmed on a super 35 uh-huh. and it still looks great yeah yeah. And we sit here and we're like, oh, we got to have full frame or we got to, and that was what you and I talked about yeah. on the phone was yeah. like, you know, full frame. It's, you know, it's, it's a little bit of a, a gimmick, I guess. It's not a gimmick, but. No, but I mean, I think a lot of times people um, geek out about specs a lot more than they right. do about, hey, how can I tell a story better with, how do you tell a story better with full frame? Really? Yeah. You know, can you tell a better story with a full frame camera? I don't think so. I don't know. The, that's a that's a question. That's a question. That that'll start some. Flame. I mean, you yeah. can tell a story. You can tell a better story with an IMAX. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Fourteen perf seventy millimeter camera. You know. Yeah. But no, know. and and I think that's the thing is I think you tell a better story by having a camera. It doesn't really matter what the camera is. I mean, right. you can tell some really good stories with nothing. I mean, so. Um, Go back. So where did you go to school at? Um, so I was looking at, uh, I took a couple years off after high school because um, I wasn't sure where, you know, where I wanted to go exactly. I knew exactly what I wanted to do, obviously, but um, I looked at a lot of four-year colleges and I was like, this is really stupid for me to spend three years doing or two years doing general education courses and then film theory and then you may get to work on a thesis project with a camera. Um, that seemed like a stupid idea to me because I knew exactly I wanted to touch a camera. Right. Um, and so um, I um, I was up at a film and video expo in Denver 
um, with my dad in like 2002 and uh, met a, a member of the American Society of Cinematographers. He was he was talking about something. His name is Darren Okada. Um, shot a bunch of major major movies. And uh, I asked him, I said, you know, what kind of film school would you go to? And he's like, oh, I've heard a lot of great things about the Los Angeles Film School. Um, and so I looked into it, and uh, um, it's a, it's a, it was a one-year intensive program um, at the time. I think now, um, I think you can split it out into two years and get your bachelor's or something, or associates or something there. Um, but uh it's, it's a one year intensive program and you get a camera the first week at that time. It was like a GH two or no, it was an XL two. They'd give us an XL two XL. Canon XL two. And I was like, Oh, that's awesome. That's exactly what I want to do. And within the first week, yeah, we were shooting our first projects and they were complete trash, but you know, like that's exactly but you what you got I a deadline that you got to get them and they're, they're just wanting you to get out and start creating, yeah, get definitely. that muscle working. Definitely. And, um, and, you know, learned kind of almost every aspect of filmmaking. Um, um, it was a great school for me. Um, cause I knew, you know, and, and it's a trade school essentially. Um, but, uh, but what a fantastic trade, <laughs> yeah. you know? Yeah. And, uh, and so, um, worked under some really awesome, awesome people and, um, you know, got to do sound design and got to do editing, which I hated. I still hate editing. Um, <laughs> and, uh, and, um, I don't know too many people that really just enjoy editing. If there is an editor, if there's an editor here listening, I will pay you to edit projects for me. I hate <laughs> editing projects. Anyway, uh, <laughs> You might get some bites off that one. (laughs) Thanks. Um, But, uh, but um, just, I mean, just loved it. And I mean, at the time, Los Angeles was the place to, to be uh, where movies are made, you know, at the time. And um, I remember the first weekend that I was there right next to the school, you know, there were, you know, rows of like 12, you know, giant tractor trailers that were set up to shoot a movie um, and they were, you know, shut down for the weekend, but I was like, wow, this is awesome. And to this day, um, you know, my most magical experiences in Los Angeles were turning a corner and going to your favorite, you know, El Pollo Loco and they're shooting like a, you know, $2 million movie at the, at the seat that you sat in when you were eating a burrito really? a week ago. Yeah. I mean, that's magical to me. <laughs> that is um, cool. There are very few things in filmmaking now that are magical to me but but turning a corner and seeing a movie being made is still very magical to me so you know you talk about like the magicalness of it yep. what is and I, this could be a really like unanswerable question but sure if you look at like your primary influence of film like what is the <laughs> film that just and in in i think everybody kind of has a you know there's 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 been all kinds of answers on yeah, that. Yeah. But what is the one that you just always gravitate to? Hmm. Yeah, that's a tough question cuz I don't look at a movie as an artistic like I don't I don't look at movies as like inspiration or artistically on the cinematography side and I'm by no means a cinematographer. Um um for me like favorite movies were like The Karate Kid and Back to the Future. Um I mean, those, like, I still look at those to this day and I'm like, those are perfect movies in my opinion. Yeah. Um, but, uh, yeah, I mean, as far as the, as far as the cinematography side of things goes for me, um, I don't know that I have influences necessarily on that. Um, you know, like for me, like seeing, and, and I see myself more as a technical person than an artistic person if that makes any sense um is that like, because of your just because of your inclination of liking the tech side of it more than the storytelling side of it a little bit and i mean i think i'm kind of moving more towards that storytelling side of it as i get older but um but i always i always joke with people that i got into the business to because i like pressing buttons <laughs> i mean you know and so um and I still really enjoy to this day pressing the record button. It's a really 
big thrill for me. <laughs> so, <laughs> no, I do too. But, actually, I'm, I'm the same. I'm. I think of myself very, very uh, middle of the road. Mm -hmm. I'm very right brain and left brain mm -hmm. when it comes to it. Yeah. But that's what I struggle with too, is because sometimes my right side, my very analytical, you know, the technical side of my brain gets me where I kind of don't pay attention to this other side. Yep. And then I get, I get flustered right. in that process. And that, I mean, for me, I mean, going back to land of milk and honey, that was kind of a great thing for me was that I had, I had people taking care of the technical side of things so that I could focus on, Hey, how do I make this shot look better? Or how do I approach this from a different viewpoint or, or that sort of thing. And it's a really wonderful thing. It was a really wonderful experience in that sense for me because um, so often I get caught up in, oh, I got to make sure that this is on the right setting and that my lights are here, here, and here. Right. And I just had, I had other people that are really excellent at what they were doing, doing their jobs very well. And I got to do my job well as a result. So. It's kind of a callback yep. to today's sponsor, being very <laughs> humble and letting other people help you on stuff. Cause it really yeah. does. It, it, it allows you to enjoy that thing that you enjoy about what you're doing. Mm -hmm. And it also allows you to kind of stretch yep. sometimes, yep. you know, and you go, Hey, no, I got that. Mm -hmm. Don't worry about it. And again, that was, I think sometimes, and I've done this, more so than not, you know, we do little films around here, uh, with my, uh, little filmmaking group and I have a tendency to want to wear the audio guy hat and the lighting guy hat and the camera guy hat and the actor hat and the script writer hat. And it's just <laughs> not, it's not good. No, it's not. And it, it's not letting other people come into that process or into the right. fold and letting them work. And I have a tendency to be a little too uh, demanding or too much. And, <laughs> and I've had to learn. I mean, I've had to step myself back off of it because I know I'm good at that stuff, but I'm not good at doing it all at the same time. Right. Right. I'm good at, you know, filming if that's all I'm doing. Yep. And, and filmmaking is a very collaborative process. It is. And that's the beauty. I think yep. that's the beauty of it. That's why we actually enjoy it. Mm hmm. And we kind of got away from it, you know, because we have to make the ever loving dollar to mm -hmm. be able to do that, you know, do the commercial work so we yeah. can make money yep. so that we can do what we love. And then we don't do what we love. Then we don't do what we love anymore. Right. <laughs> right. Yep. It's kind of spooky. Yeah. So you went to Los Angeles Film School. Mm -hmm. And I assume that you did some, you got some pretty good networking. And then you probably went in and started like working with other people within the industry from that, didn't you? Yeah. Yeah. So, um, and I, I've heard it from a couple people here in Springfield recently. It's like, why would anyone ever go to film school? Um, and, and I would, you know, I would to a certain extent agree with them nowadays. Um, but, uh, almost 17 years ago, um, we didn't have YouTube tutorials on how to do everything. It has changed um, a ton in a decade. 17 years ago, we didn't have master class and, you know, all these things. Um, and, and what I really got out of, what I really got out of school was networking, obviously. Um, to this day, the clients that I have are um, a direct result of people that I met in film school or met on film school jobs. So, um, so I'm thankful for that eternally. Um, but, um, um, you know, the network networking aspect was great, but also, I mean, how to do things properly, you know, there is a way to do things and then there's a way to do things properly. And I feel like, um, you know, going to school for filmmaking, um, was learning how to do things properly. Now, do I do it properly all the time? No, of course not. Um, cause it's fun breaking the rules every now and then, <laughs> but at the same time, you know, like treating your actors with respect and being quiet on set when there's a serious scene and, uh, knowing your place on set, you know, if you're a PA and you're interjecting, you know, to the director, Hey, this is what should happen. No, that's, that's not what should happen. You and know? you won't be on set for exactly. very long either. <laughs> exactly. So, um, so that, I mean, that, uh, 
that uh, helped tremendously. And I really think that I was in the right place at the right time. We, I shot, you know, 35 millimeter film. I shot 16 millimeter film. And then at the, at the time that I was going through film school, um, Sony had just come out with the, um, the Sony F 900, which is what it was like the first, uh, digital cinema camera out there. Um, and so, you know, like star Wars, the crappy star Wars that nobody wants to talk about. Those were all shot on that camera. Um, the movie collateral with Tom Cruise was one of the first and, and we saw that and we were like, oh my gosh, this is what you can do with a non-film camera. That's so cool. <laughs> you know, and then what, Sin City, I think Sin City came out about the same time. Yeah. And and what media were they recording to on those? So it was, re- it was recording to HD cam tapes. So it's basically, um, it's a beta cam sized tape that was, uh, that was HD cam essentially. Um, Do you ever have any issues with those? Never. Like, never? Never. No. Um, I still to this day miss tape based systems, especially because you can just hand it off to a producer and say, there you go, instead of transferring it to a hard drive for two hours after the right. <laughs> after the shoot day. Wow. Um, so I was, you know, it was on the cusp of like, you know, all these different mediums and stuff. And so um, and being in the right place at the right time, I was um, I kind of skipped. I mean, I paid my dues. Don't get me wrong in <laughs> in. Uh, in stuff, but uh, I I started right into the camera department as a camera assistant on a lot of stuff, um, whereas a lot of people have to start out as a camera PA. So, um, give us the distinction between what a camera assistant and a camera PA does. Um, a camera PA goes and gets cups of coffee for the camera assistants, and then carries all the heavy stuff. Um, And, you know, uh, um, on a lot of projects, I was a second camera assistant. So um, I'm lugging a lot of heavy stuff around. I'm loading the film in the 100-degree weather inside a trailer with the lights off kind of stuff. Um, And, uh, um, you know, just organizing gear. The first day sees busy, you know, being on set, um, pulling focus. Um, And I'm making sure that, you know, the 52-pound tripod uh, you know, is where it's supposed to be, you know, and the 15 cases of stuff, you know? Wow. So, um, so yeah, so I was able to do a lot of cool, you know, lower end, uh, movie projects there. Um, and then the writer's strike hit, um, about six months after I graduated film school. And so no movies were being made. And here I am paying a thousand bucks a month for an apartment, and uh, no movies are being made. This is what I got into the business for. And oh, wow. uh, so it got a little scary. And then I had a friend <laughs> that called me up and said, hey, I'm shooting a reality show in Joplin, Missouri. Do you want to come out for a while? And I said, yeah. Is it money? Yeah. It's not very good money, but it's money. And uh, I'll so take it. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, yeah, I'll do whatever. And so uh, that's kind of what brought me out to Missouri. Um was uh, was working on on this TV show out here. Uh, it was a show called Trick My Truck uh, for CMT, um, and we shot like six seasons of it. Really? Um, yeah. And uh, what would you so, shoot that on? So that was all shot on DV cam and mini DV. And this is, I mean, th- mind you, this is before um, we had any s- like solid state based uh, camera systems. So, um. So like things that we take for granted today, like GoPros and drones and all that stuff, um, we didn't have any of that stuff because it hadn't been invented yet. And so we were strapping little tiny mini DV cameras to these trucks and driving them down the highway, you know, and, and these mini DV tapes would shake until they stopped recording and stuff. And we had, a you know, it was addressing technical right. issues. Um, but, now, did uh, you all edit that? We the, didn't. No, you didn't, we would. So you uh, were handing that stuff off then? We would every single day send overnight express all the tapes t- back to California and they'd cut it there. Really? So, yeah. So, um, and, um, it was a, it was a tough show to work on because it was, uh, it was hot and it was messy and, you know, we were sometimes shooting eight or nine cameras at a time. So you're seriously, you're, you're looking at nine, you know, nine videotapes times, you know, sometimes four, four, you know, 
four tapes of each of those. Now, how much you know? was, how much could you hold on one tape? How much? Like sixty minutes. Sixty minutes. Yeah, so. And that was shooting at like ten eighty or seven twenty. <laughs> No, this is what we call standard definition. Oh, yeah. so you were like back time. in standard. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. So, yeah. That is, that's yeah. cool, man. And I, so I think about it now, uh, you know, like if we could shoot that show again, how different it would feel. Oh, you know, yeah. How much cooler it would be, but whatever. So did you ever like dabble in uh, like the like the linear editing? Um. Like tape to tape stuff. Tape to tape. Yeah. I, well, in high school, I did. You yeah. Did. Yeah. So. But afterwards, you didn't do. You kind of no, stayed out of that. I mean, um, my senior year of school, I bought a mini DV camera, and I was like, "Wow, I just plug this into a computer, and I cut it inside a computer, and I spit it back out on the tape. That's awesome, you know." Right. Um. So. It's wild. So you were done then after yeah. at that <laughs> yeah. point. Yeah. Yeah. So. That's cool. Yeah. So that got you to, and so when did you, now, I guess we need to talk about your business. Yeah. Right. Uh, so we don't, so, we don't have to talk about so w- w- you have your own company though, right? Yeah. And what's that called? Uh, well, I'm, I'm operating under a name called motion stills LLC. Um, I shot, uh, I shot still photos on set years and years ago when I was out in Los Angeles. Um, and, uh, and kind of had that name. It worked for that. Um, and, uh, so I just kind of carried that on to my LLC to kind of separate, um, business from personal stuff. Sure. And so, um, but, uh, yeah, I do a lot, a lot of corporate stuff, a lot of, um, you know, internal corporate stuff and then corporate storytelling as well. Um, one of my clients that I'm thrilled to work with is FedEx. Oh, um, nice. And, uh, and so, um, Several years ago, um, they were releasing their first electric vehicle, um, and uh, I got to take pictures of that electrical vehicle going down the Route 66 the whole way from Chicago to L.A., and they were just like, take pretty pictures of this truck as it drives through these picturesque landscapes of uh, Route 66, and I was like, really? This is like showing up every day for... Yeah. for this, uh, this is work. Um, and so sub uh, like, um, um, I continued that relationship with them and, uh, I'm just got back last week from, from Dallas shooting interviews, uh, about their new, uh, robot, their same day robot that, uh, it's called a Roxo, um, that delivers, you know, it, it pulls itself up onto sidewalks and delivers boxes to your door. Um, really? Yeah. So That's it's crazy. It's in the early stages and they're still doing development, but, but to, um, to get to see a robot in action was really, <laughs> really well, kind of awesome. Yeah. So, um, every time I work with FedEx, it's always something that I can't believe that I'm, you know, doing, um, right. just got back not too long ago from Wichita. They, um, they built with Cessna, they built these newer, um, newer airplanes, um, that can handle, more more freight in in smaller spaces and uh for like smaller markets so that you know um so they can deliver to like regional airports and or smaller smaller airports, airports. yeah so things that would have to be driven by truck uh, long distances can now be taken by plane and so they're in the final um you know testing phase of this new you know, airplane. Um, That's super cool. Yeah. And of course, as a filmmaker, you get to kind of be in on the, you get to be in on that story, obviously. Right. That's just kind of neat. Right. And I'm, uh, I, you know, preparing for this podcast, I'm like, what am I going to say? What am I going to talk about? Uh, I think I got to experience all the really, a lot of really cool stuff as I was younger. Um, and now that I have a, a wife and kids, um, I get to do a lot of stuff that's closer to home, which is really important to me. Yeah. And I'm slowly and painfully learning the lessons of, um, um, work life balance. Yeah. Um, but I think, uh, I think I'm starting to figure that out. Yeah. It's, um, you want to figure it out before you start figuring out what the word regret means. Yeah. 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 And I'm all, I, I've, <laughs> yeah, that's because, a very good way to say it. because I, I went through, I would say, like the last five years, you know, I I mean, for a while there, I mean, I think I probably spent half my year on the road, Mm -hmm. 
half my year packing up all my gear, yep. throwing it in the car, yep. setting it up, getting back on the road, driving back. And then I spent a half of um, you know, probably two whole years. That was a big reason why we moved from Dallas because I was in Dallas and I was traveling all over to mm-hmm. go film. Mm-hmm. And I missed so much of my kids growing up Mm -hmm. and being there just for them in a, in a very strange place, which was Texas for us at the time. Yeah. And that was a big reason why we moved back here is because they afforded me the ability to kind of be closer to home and be able to, uh, experience that story Mm -hmm. of my family that I made. And it definitely does make a big difference. (laughs) Yeah. 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 I, uh, we, um, um, we signed, signed the papers for our house. Um, this was, you know, a decade ago, we signed the papers for our house. And then the next day, uh, I left for eight weeks on a job, uh, wow. and my wife had to move in, uh, to our new house by herself. Well, my parents were there in a moving company, but you know what I'm saying? Yeah. It's, uh, it's one of those things like, it's a really tough balance. Cause yeah. on one hand I want to provide for my family. And on the other hand, um, I want to be there for my family. Yeah. So, <laughs> yeah, yeah, it is. Yeah. It's very deep and it's rough and yeah. it's, but, um, yeah, that is, I would say work life balance as a filmmaker also running your own, own business is, um, it's a lot. Mm-hmm. It's a lot because you have to be somewhere to film. Right. It's not like you can do it from home remotely. It's no. it's kind of tough. Yeah. Yeah. You can't make a movie with a Zoom call. Yeah. Although I'm sure there'll be a movie. Oh there. yeah. <laughs> They're gonna do it. They're gonna do it. Yeah. So um, and I know you got to get going here pretty oh, I'm quick. All right. Yeah. Um, yeah. But what are um, when you're looking at kind of down the road because you've talked about that you'd like to be able to do more films mm-hmm. and actually. What are what are those films that you like watching that you would like to make? Um, definitely comedies. You like I, comedy. I really would love to work on on some comedy stuff. I've worked on comedy movies in the past, and it's, I mean, it's like you're showing up. I mean, you work hard, just like on any other movie. You work really hard, but um, you're around people that are just hilarious, and it's uh, it makes twelve hours on set fly by. Mm-hmm. Um, so I'd love to do that. I'd really love to, to, to do more of the documentary side of things and telling, telling stories that can hopefully promote some change, um, somehow. Um, and I mean, there are a lot of great stories to tell. Um, but, um, yeah, I think, I think documentary stuff would be a lot of fun for me. I just want to, I just want to have time on a project. Like for me, I want to be able to, um, to block out an entire month and say, okay, I'm going to shoot something. Roll around in it. Yeah. 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 I feel the same way. I'd like to be able to, and I think that's one reason why the commercial work for me Mm -hmm. got a little bit of a slog because it was just like, it was, it was like by the time you could get one project finished Mm -hmm. and you didn't even have time to pat yourself on the back and you're already starting on the next one. Yeah. And then you're on the next one. And by the time it's all over with, you're like, Wow, it was two months ago, and I did really good job on that one there. And I didn't even like, I didn't even reward myself by going, "Hey, let me sit and watch it." Right. You know, it, it gets yeah. you almost become where you create too much. And I think what I always felt is like, is like, I don't even remember making that edit right on that. Yeah. Why did I do that? Yeah. You know. Side note. Uh, I think you try and use the word "slog" in every episode. Of the podcast. Do I say it a lot? No, you just say it once an episode. Do I really? I think so. I love the No, I like it. I Uh, like it. Yeah. Have you ever read the book, The Dip? No, I haven't. Uh, Seth Godin. uh, The book is very, very interesting. And Mm -hmm. it's super short. It's like maybe 100. I don't even think it's 100 pages. I think it's like 80 pages. Yeah. But he talks about... um, the dip and the dip is where it's the slog. It's where you find out (laughs) that this is not worth going down Hmm. this road. And this Hmm. is when it's okay to quit. Yeah. And that's the whole basis of it. But the slog is the, it's the part where your endurance has to kick in. Yeah. And if it doesn't kick in, 
and you don't enjoy what you're doing and yeah. you start, it's just like, well, the podcast, mm-hmm. for example, mm-hmm. I just hit one like a couple weeks ago, whenever I had all these other things going on in my life and yeah. it's like, I don't have time for the podcast. Right. And I'm like, I gotta, I gotta do it. Yeah. I gotta do it. I gotta push through it. I gotta push <laughs> through it. And it is, it's hard. It's a slog. Yep. Yeah. 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 Huh. So I think it's the dip. I'm pretty sure it's the dip. I'll take a look at it. Go out and read that book. It's like I said, it takes maybe an hour to two hours to read it, but it's very insightful and it changed my mind on a couple of things. I'll listen to it on the drive up to yeah. St. Louis this weekend. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, you have to listen to your podcast. No, please don't. <laughs> this needs to go back into like a just in case section. Just in case Definitely I don't Definitely not. Have. Already, already, it's it, it's a it's at least a, probably a 70 or 80 downloader oh, on the first day. Stop. Yeah. Stop. It totally is. <laughs> so what projects, do you got any projects like that you've been looking at that you're going to do that are coming up? Hmm. Is there any like uh, things that you can talk about that maybe nobody knows about right now? Hmm. Um, that's a toughie. Um, there, there is a, there is a project that's going to take up kind of some of my April. Um, and it's, uh, it has to deal with, uh, with local cattle ranchers here. Um, and while it's not a documentary, um, it's going to feel a lot more like storytelling than, um, corporate stuff. Um, it's, uh, it's for a, a good, a good client of mine. Um, and, uh, so, so that's coming up. Um, the problem is like, people are always like, yeah, what's on the horizon? I don't know. You know, yeah. like, uh, and, and, you know, maybe I need to, maybe I need to slow the corporate thing down just a little bit and, and make a little more time to, you know, to do projects that, that I, you know, um, that are meaningful. Yeah. And it's, well, no, cause I mean, cause the projects that I do with my are clients meaningful. are meaningful, yeah. but, um, you know, just something where I'm, I'm not under a deadline and not under, you know, what somebody else wants or not trying to get it out tomorrow. You know, yeah. I've, I'm trying to finish up a project. Somebody gave me a project yesterday, uh, and they said, you know, can we have it by Friday? <laughs> <laughs> and I'm like, yeah. Of course, you know, sure. cause I, I really respect these people, but at the same time, um, I don't know that people a lot of times understand that stuff takes time, you know, yeah. uh, projects take time. Um, even when, you know, even when I can devote a ton of time to it, you know, um, it still takes time. You know, and that I ran into this, um, a while back was that I had a client that was like, they wanted to do this project. They didn't give enough time to be able to, you know, fully, uh, put your best foot forward on. And I was a little upset and I was like, you know, I'm, I, I kind of wish I had more time to be able to formulate this, build a story off of it and get it. So it pushed out and made it look better for you. And they were like, well, we're not really worried about that. And I thought about that for a second. I thought, (laughs) Yeah, but I am. Yeah. My goal in life is to do a good job. Right. It's not to do a sloppy job for you. Right. Because that doesn't look good for me or my business. And no. so, and what's funny is I've ran into that a few times throughout my career. It's like, well, we're not really worried about that. I go, well, I know, but you're paying me, so I am worried right. about it. Yeah. I am worried about how this shot looks. I am worried about, you know how the audio sounds. Mm -hmm. I'm worried about how the edit looks. I'm worried about all those little things. And I think, you know, when we're quote unquote shredders or guerrilla filmmakers (laughs) or whatever you want to call it, um, because we kind of touched on this a while ago too, is that I don't think people realize in this field or this headspace that we're in of, you know, if when you are your own audio person and you're your own, uh, camera guy and you're your own producer and director and lighting person and scheduler and all that good stuff. It's not because we're being stingy with our money. It's because honestly, 
to make our bottom line on a project, we really can't have anybody else on the project. Right. Yeah. Um, it's not that we don't want to share in the wealth. It's just that the wealth's not there to share. And they, a lot of these clients want us to do everything because that's how they're able to, to afford us. Right. But with that being said, it's a very hard job in, when you get into that realm, Mm -hmm. you know, like, um, for example, I had a client one time and they were like, so you're going to be here for about three hours. Like, yeah, I'm going to be there for three hours, but I'm on, I got an hour to pack up, maybe two hours to pack up. And then I got an hour to unpack everything Mm -hmm. before I go to another project. So it's actually six hours, you know, Mm -hmm. and it's the two hours that I laid in bed last night thinking on the project because there is no shot list. Uh, You don't have a script, you don't have an idea. And then when you get in there and you make it look good and it's, it's easy. Yeah. And it's not really easy. <laughs> no, no. Yeah. That's, so th- there is a lot involved in it. Definitely. And don't get me wrong. I love that process, mm-hmm. but I also don't like the fact that it's become cheapened because we've made it look easy in some regard, I guess. Right. Or there's somebody that will do it for cheaper. Yeah. You know, at the same time. Yeah. Um, yeah. No, it's, uh, it's, uh, I can't tell you how many times though I wake up, I wake up every day that there's a project to work on and I wake up early uh, and I can't wait to get started. Even when it's something that I'm dreading, I can't, I can't wait. I cannot wait to, to shoot it. I can't wait to light a better interview. I can't wait to shoot better B-roll or do, you know, a lot of the, (laughs) if I could shoot B-roll for the rest of my life, I would just, Sit in a corner and shoot be roll. I might, uh, I might call you up for some projects. Oh man, do <laughs> uh, I'll, I'll shoot it for free. I will shoot B roll no, for free for you. you. Can't shoot. I love you, shooting B roll. No, you can't shoot stuff for free. It's That's like the crack cocaine of filmmaking Is it? for me. Yeah, I just, okay. I, I love observing. I love being okay. a fly on the wall. Yeah, I always have. Yeah. And I mean, that's how I got into photography is okay. because I loved being kind of outside and observing like people watching yeah you know it was just it was the funnest part of it yeah that's why i bought that that 50 to 120 it's (laughs) because now i can sit even further away (laughs) yeah right and you can just sit there and because you've got that 70 by 200 millimeter canon right yeah i don't love that lens but yes yeah but it it's good for that kind of stuff if you really want to just like get way back and Mm -hmm. like which i guess that's kind of intrusive on people if they're not if they know they're not being filmed. <laughs> I don't know. I've, uh, ever since I've, sorry, exited, I took us well, off. No, I took okay. us off. The, ever yeah. since I exited the reality television side of things, I, I don't ever like to, uh, uh, intrude on people's personal lives. Do some really. crash zooms. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, no, it's, it, um, what were you saying? I'm sorry. I, cause I kind of, I kind of interrupted you, uh, cause I was talking about B-roll. Um, Oh, just, I mean, just getting up every, every morning. Like I, I can't imagine doing anything else than what I do, you know? I know. And even when it's uh even when it's a project that I'm less than thrilled about, or when it's a project that I know that I'm being thrown into, you know, a lion's den, uh, to do, um, I, I still can't imagine doing anything else, Yeah. you know? I've, I've, I've really struggled with it over like the course of the last year because I've thought about, and it's weird. Like Mm -hmm. I will go down the road of like, you know, they need a filmmaker. So I'm going to go apply for this job. Mm -hmm. And then I get down that road and I'm like, no, I don't want to do that. Mm -hmm. I want to do the stuff that I've been doing. I want to have this. I've just now, I've spent a decade and I figured it out and now I'm going to go change it, you know? (laughs) Yeah. It's like, I just got to where I could figure this stuff out and now I want to go change it and go do something else. And so it is, it's, it's frustrating. Uh, it's that wanderlust of things, but that's what I, I think filmmaking has of all the jobs that I've ever had in my life. And I've had a ton of them. Mm -hmm. Um, 10 years ago I decided to go into filmmaking and it was the one thing that just, it fit for me. Yeah. It was something new every day. Definitely. It was a oh challenge gosh. every day. Yeah. Uh, I had something to beat myself up with every single day. Yeah. And look at it and go, I need to change that. I need to not do that again. Yep. 
Yeah. I've experienced, I mean, I've experienced a lot of stuff that most people don't get to experience in a lifetime, you know, short of going to space. I still feel, I still have these recurring dreams that I'm going to get a call to shoot up in space and I'm going to have to ask my wife if that's okay. Uh, and she's going to say no. I'll, I'll <laughs> shoot course. B-roll for okay. you if you do. Yeah. But, uh, like, yeah, no, I mean, uh, the, so if Elon, if you're listening, <laughs> uh, Sam and I will, we would probably do it. We do it for a good cost. You wouldn't have to spend like yeah, millions no. and billions of dollars on us. We would, I would, I would go up there for, I would go up there for pretty cheap actually in yeah. film. Just pay off my mortgage so that when oh, I, yeah. yeah, just pay yeah. off my mortgage. Pay off my mortgage. That'd be great. Yeah. I just yeah. bought a new house. So yeah, it'd be awesome. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, yeah. But uh, I, I think that that's where, and I think for me, going back to the slog, mm-hmm. th- that's what gets me through that kind of stuff is because I generate projects for myself that allow me to kind of stay back in that, in that love portion of mm-hmm. what I do. Mm-hmm. Because there are projects that come up and it's like you say, eh, I don't really want to do it. I still love going and setting up a camera. Mm-hmm. I love getting my angles figured out. Mm-hmm. I love setting my lights up. I love setting my audio up. Yep. I love it whenever I get it back home and I put it on the computer and I look at it and go, ah, did a good job on that, <laughs> you know? Yeah. And my lighting looks good. I, you know, set my white balance perfect and it just color grades perfectly. And you're like, hey, I did it good. But there are some days that I would like going out and just, again, and I, I know I tell everybody I love sitting out in the woods and taking pictures of flowers, flowers and yeah. I just can't help it. Yeah. It's like, it's that thing that I love. And honestly here I'm counting down the days <laughs> because they're going to start popping out here pretty soon. And yeah. I'm going to be right there yeah. to capture all of it with my brand new camera. Definitely. Definitely. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, if I can get like all the wheels in motion going, I'll have the new camera probably within two weeks, hopefully. Cool. Yeah. Cool. And then I'm just going to be off to the races again. <laughs> and I did buy, I bought an easy rig. Okay. Awesome. Because I'm getting too old uh, to <laughs> carry a 20 pound rig around all the time. So yes. I did buy, I bought an easy rig and it's on its way. That's awesome. So I can do some of my, and I'll, I'll have you, have you ever worked with one of those? I have. Yeah. Um, it's, uh, it's been a few years, but, uh, I, I liked it. I mean, it's, again, it's one of those things. Um, if you're not, if you're not using it on a daily basis, you know, um, you kind of lose how to use it correctly, you know? Yeah. Um, and granted it's just, you know, sitting in front of you, but, uh, I think there's still a process to it. Yeah. If you Um, don't know what an easy rig is, it's basically a backpack. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think they're made in Sweden, aren't they? Yeah, some some place. And it has a bar that goes over the top of your head. It kind of comes up from the backpack, and it has a kind of a, a cord that comes down, and it, mm-hmm. you attach kind of the top of your your camera rig, and it takes probably about ninety five percent of the weight off of what you're holding. Well. Yeah, no, 20, but it just moves it. 80%? It just moves it to your uh, your hips. That's yeah. all. Yeah, it you moves still, all the weight to your hips. You still That's feel right. it at the end of the day. Yeah. yeah. And now that I have, you know, holding a gimbal, you get it right between your shoulder blades. Oh, yeah. And it's almost just excruciatingly. I, there's been times where I'll sit and run a gimbal all day and I'll get done and I'll just have to lay down and, like, let the Charlie horses subside in Definitely. my back. Yeah. So, Yeah. I, I bought one. I, I, I guess I can just switch off from hips to shoulders, hips to shoulders, hips yeah, to shoulders. There yeah. you go. <laughs> have you ever done Sato? I have not. No. Have you um, ever thought about it? I have I have thought about it. Um, I don't know that it appeals to me. It will. I don't know. Like It is so- a butt kicker. It's a butt kicker. Yeah. I uh, I did a 24 hour project uh, in back in California when I was still out there. Um and, um, I don't know. It didn't, I don't know that it appeals to me because I like, I've done so much like quick turnaround stuff that it doesn't appeal to me at all. <laughs> like I want to do something uh, like I want to do a 48 week pro- right. <laughs> project. Well, you know? it's, it very much like the first year that I did Sato, uh-huh. I wrote a script 
I filmed it. Mm-hmm. I directed it. I edited it. I loaded half the props to the space. I went and scouted locations. I did all that stuff. Yeah. And I absolutely hated it. I mean, I really just hated it. And then I had talked to some people like during that Sato and I talked mm-hmm. to them and they were like, oh no, you gotta, you know, it's, it's about the collaboration of things. That's the exercise. And I was like, okay. Okay. So yeah, then the no, next year, that. the next year we, we got the, you know, I was over here at the office and we had our little, uh, where they give us your, your inspiration packet. And I just went in there with a the mindset that let's just, let's do this. Let's mm-hmm. just have fun. Mm-hmm. You know, let's, let's have this as a fun exercise. And when I got my mindset in that it was going to be fun and I was going to be working with some, with very dear friends of mine yeah. and we were going to do this stuff, then all of a sudden it was just, it was so much, we had such a good time. Yeah. I, I wrote a script in like 15 minutes and I got to use my anamorphic lens because cool. it was like, you know, it was the whole COVID thing. So I said, well, social distancing, we'll just keep everybody really far apart <laughs> and really we'll film it lens. out. Yeah. And I used, you know, and so it was, <laughs> it was just fun. And yeah. I had such a good experience that, I mean, the year before we had a great experience, the product wasn't as good. Yeah. This last year we had a great experience and we actually won an award and awesome. it was kind of fun. Awesome. And, um, yeah, maybe I have to give it a try. We'll I see think you should. Yeah. If you, if you if you want a team to to jump on, you can always jump on ours, and okay. and uh, I'll let you push the buttons if you want to. So <laughs> you know, feel you'll free. let me press the record button. <laughs> oh my gosh! But it's it, it is it's fun and yeah. it's it's a it's a neat exercise in seeing if you can write on the fly. Mm-hmm. Um, everybody get along, you know. Yeah. Get it captured, get it edited, and get it submitted by by the deadline. Yeah. And, we did, and it was fun. Cool. My son did one last year. Yeah? He did. Um, and he's kind of getting into it, it sounds he like. He is. Yeah, yeah he is. Yeah, actually, cool. he was talking to me last night, and he was like, hey, Dad, uh, I want to introduce audio into my uh, Sato film this year. I'm like, awesome. okay. Awesome. He goes, so how do I do it? I go, I said, Google's your friend. <laughs> Figure it out. Oh man. And he doesn't like that, but no. I, you know, you should, you should help him out. No. This is your, this is your father son like moment right here. This is his slog. Okay. Yeah. All right. All right. That's my thought. <laughs> That's my thought. All right. I want him to, you know, I think that's the thing that I enjoyed about getting into filmmaking is, and, you know, back mm-hmm. when, cause you got started in it well before I did really, um, because you went to school in what 2002 you said 2003 yeah. 2003 yeah. I mean I didn't even start till you know 2014 or 15 but um actually 2005 yeah 10 years <laughs> so but I think the to me the the fun part of the filmmaking was the discovery of things mm-hmm. you know it was like learning how to you know you 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 add in new pieces as you go along you're like I'm gonna add a light this time and yeah I'm going to add audio and all that. And I think that that, and you appreciate it more because you uh, paid for it in a way. (laughs) Right. Yeah, Yeah, definitely. (laughs) Definitely. Yeah. I think, uh, I think a lot of times people try and add everything at once. Yes. You know, um, I agree. And, uh, I am guilty of it. Um, I'm guilty of it in the gear aspect, you know, sometimes and, uh, and just trying to, trying to do too much stuff all at the same time. And so I don't know. It's important. Um, I did just, uh, I just worked on a project, uh, last week and, uh, I brought one light. No, I brought two lights. Who am I kidding? I brought two lights Redundancy. and, uh, <laughs> and, um, and just a uh, handheld my, my S one H. Um, and I, I'm like, I want to do this. I want to strip everything down and just do this, you know, it's very, um, it's very liberating to do that it every is. now and then. Yeah. And I think some of my better, I don't know, like every once in a while I'm like, I would have, I would have worked way too hard to make this picture look not as good, you know? Yeah. Like just sometimes shooting things naturally, <laughs> Yeah, you know, you know uh, is, uh, is better. Or just, uh, 
just kind of rolling with it. Keep it simple, stupid, right? Yes. My dad is a yeah. firm believer in that. And so, yeah, keep it simple, stupid. What is, in your opinion, what is the, and you, you don't have to answer it because your wife may listen to this and that's probably going to, what is your most expensive piece of gear that you also look at as the thing that you never use? Oh, Ooh, that's a good one. That's a good question. Um, my most expensive gear, piece of gear that I don't use, quasar bulbs. Quasars. It's not, and it's not horribly expensive, but I, I made a stupid decision. Uh, I was um, traveling on the road, and I was needing to fill an emotional need. Uh, <laughs> and so I bought a quasar four by four kit with the, you know, with the Kino case, right. That it's basically a Kino four by four bank, but with quasars instead. And I've, I've used that exactly once and I don't use quasars much. Was it to impress? No, it was to fill my, um, selfish desires. Right. And it didn't. I didn't feel it. I'm I'm slowly painfully learning about the gear stuff and 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 I'm but I'm also of the of the world that if it's not getting used it goes out the door. Right. Um really quickly. Um so there isn't like a really expensive piece of gear that I don't use really other than something like that be, because like if it doesn't get used it's not worth my time and I and like I might as well spend money on something I will use. Right. What um, piece of gear have you bought to impress an, a client? Like just for the look, yeah, not yeah. because it gave you the aesthetic that you needed. Um, I would say uh, like, so I have the Aperture Nova P300, which is an RGB soft light. Um, and I bought that initially because I was like, oh, well, you know, I should, I, I should have an RGB light. And then I didn't use it as an RGB light for a while. And now I'm starting to use it quite a bit as an RGB light. I don't know if I, I've ever bought, oh, I'll tell you what I bought to impress a client. Na doy. Uh, so, um, and this goes back to Land of Milk and Honey. So I rented uh, uh, a Deneke TSC Smart Slate um, for oh, yeah. Land of Milk and Honey um, because I wanted... I wanted the kids on the set to kind of have a, as much of a Hollywood experience as possible. And so people think, Oh, a slate is a re- is a very Hollywood thing, you know? Um, and seeing the slate clapped is, you know, a big deal and seeing a time code slate, um, makes it feel even more validating. Um, and nowadays, you know, time code slates aren't really super necessary. Uh, anymore because you know we're getting scratch track audio right. to to camera and um everything's jam synced anyway and stuff so why do you need to see what your time code is saying um but after land of milk and honey um i looked at the purchase price of it after rentals and i was like well it's expensive but i'll buy it and i bought it and it was you know a thousand dollars what well listen okay i know yes i know <laughs> Uh, but every single client shoot that I go to, they want to Instagram and Facebook, right. The slate. And I, um, I take very painstakingly, uh, great. I go to great lengths to make the slate look great. I label it. I will put logos and labels really in color if I have to. Yeah. So like with, with FedEx, we just shot last week. Um, we were shooting this Roxo robot. Well, I found a picture of the robot. Uh, I have a color label maker that, that prints in color, um, stuck a color version of Roxo, the robot on there, stuck a color FedEx logo on there and they, they ate it up. Right. And, and yes, it's a very expensive piece of equipment that isn't super necessary in this day and age. Um, um, but I guess that impresses clients. Yeah. It does. It does. And and it also, I mean. But you've been able to justify why you did that, though. Because, I mean, that does make. Yes. I mean, it's the client experience, too. As long as they're happy about what you're doing. and Well, and I've also, I mean, I've also been slating the stuff that I'm shooting as well just because I when I get back to the cutting room floor, I don't, oh, cutting room floor. Mm. What, are, what is this? 1976 <laughs> here? Uh, no, when I get back to cut it together, I don't want to have to spend 
45 minutes scrubbing timelines to try and figure out what is what shot, you know, yeah. and I'm doing, I'm doing a lot of three camera shoots by myself, <laughs> by myself, you know, um, and so I, I've got this crap load of footage that I want to make sure that, uh, that everything is, you know, what it's supposed to be. So, um, I, I have justified the cost in my mind right. and there aren't very many things uh, like I, um, all right, no, well, real quick. Yeah, yeah. What's the cheapest piece of gear that you bought oh. that you use the most? Oh. Hmm. Uh. Let's come back to that one. Okay. Yeah. No, that's, uh, yeah, we might have to think about that one for a minute. Because there are a couple that, oh, okay. Yeah. No, um, there are a couple things. So and you can't say gaffer's tape. No. <laughs> they're not cheap anyways. No. Um, I, uh, so I have a, um, a Magliner Junior cart, which is a, a camera cart that has, one too. that has, um, you know, top and a bottom shelf. I bought it right after film school. It's been with me through, you know, 15 moves in my entire life and and it's been on a bunch of sets and I have a long history with it and I love that cart um, but it doesn't fit into the vehicle so well when my vehicle's packed with gear um, so a few years ago I bought a uh, a little tiny rock and roller multi-cart it's a black and yellow cart you can find them on Amazon They're for like great. 180 bucks at the most or something and that has been one of the greatest investments I've made because I jam my car full of gear and then that's how i got all this stuff in here <laughs> that's awesome yeah yeah and and nowhere i go can you just like waltz in you know 15 feet from where you're shooting you're you're huffing it um and so um and it's a small footprint too it's a like teen, it folds you up you can into, fold it up really yeah. really easy and you can slap it and like slide it into something and right you, yeah it's great and then it scratches up the inside of your car yep. oh yeah. yeah yeah so but i bought the smallest one that they had and it's it's been a fantastic investment i will try to put links to all these pieces of gear because these are all really good <laughs> things to know yeah. about folks yeah uh, except for the quasars, don't. Oh yeah. yeah. Well, no, and there are people that that love yeah, quasars and love what they can do, and they are good at it. I mean, we've got a great community of people, um, um, you know, professional videographers in this town that know know what they want and get get that stuff out of what they gear, what you know, the gear that they have. Go buy you a really bright LED light and a fixture, and an eighteen dollar. China globe <laughs> and you can light a room with it. Yeah. 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 <laughs> it's no. one of my favorite ones right there. <laughs> the China ball, the China ball. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. That gear stuff is just, um, it's a blessing and a curse, you know, cause you're always saying to myself, Oh, well, if I just had this, I could do this better. Or if, you know, and, um, you know, you find out, really quickly a lot of times that that's not always the case. You well, know? you know, something that um, uh, Tim Makalek and mm -hmm. uh, Michael, Ack, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, Tim, and um, uh, Joseph Giddens, we've all been kind of talking back or back and forth, and we want to set up a, a Midwest NAB <laughs> where a bunch of us can like find an area and we just bring all of our gear in uh -huh. to let everybody else look at it. Because, I mean, around yeah. here, you yeah. don't, it's all like we see it on, you know, Adorama or B and H yeah. or Amazon, but you don't ever have that tactile like actually get to look at it and see what it what it feels yeah. like or yeah. does. But there's a lot of us around here that have all kinds of different gear and it'd be kind of fun to be able to go, Hey, I set up my booth, you can come over here and look at my stuff <laughs> and I'm gonna go over and I'm gonna look at yeah. your stuff yeah. and just kind of see what everybody has. That's, that's I don't know if that's a, a good idea. thing or a bad thing because it yeah. could get the gear envy worse yeah. around here, but there is a lot of that kind of, it would be fun to be able to see what everybody else is shooting with mm -hmm. and kind of do a, I don't know, a little expo. Yeah. Yeah. I don't like to be showy though. That's the problem. Like I don't want to show off like what I have either. Yeah. Uh, other than a thousand dollars late. <laughs> you know? I did for a while. <laughs> I won't, I won't lie. I did for a while. I mean, I bought, I bought a Z cam. I bought mm -hmm. a black magic pocket cinema camera. Mm -hmm. I had a Sony, uh, R seven, three, R or a seven R three. And I had a GH five. Mm -hmm. 
And I only filmed off of one of those cameras. Yeah. And yeah. I was like, what am I doing with it? And so I, I mean, I, I sold most of that stuff. And I'm just like, all right, I'm going down to one. Yeah. And well, and I mean, the time that you must have spent in post trying to match all those things up. Is, it's a pain in the butt. Yeah. 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 So, so yeah. <laughs> Live and learn. Yeah. Die and forget it all. Definitely. Well, Sam, it has been great <laughs> having you on the podcast has it, has it? i'm sorry everybody. it is no no it has been awesome and i can't wait for you to hear yourself on I it i don't want to <laughs> i will skip that week I well i tell you what let me know if you like seriously if you want to do like the sado thing let me know when um, is it i don't even know when it is i want to say it's april 16th it's like the weekend of the 16th 17th and 18th of april and um uh, yeah, I'm on a project. I think I really, <laughs> that's a pro that's the problem. Like I can't commit to much stuff either. Cause it's like, well, I'm already on something or, well, I'll see what I can do. I'll yeah. see what I can do. Check it's and a see. weekend. Check it's and a see. Weekend. And for my listening audience out there. Uh, so Jeff and jaw who runs Sato reached out to me to do a little plug for, um, for the Bravo podcast, which I really appreciate, but I got busy with the move and everything and I didn't get to write anything up, but go out there and start checking out the whole Sato thing. If you haven't done it, put your name in and try it. Everybody's got a video camera in their pocket. <laughs> go out and make a film. It is a ton of fun. You're going to meet a lot of great people along the process. It's only going to hurt for a little bit. And then when you're done with it at the end, you'll be itching to go out and make another film. And, uh, this is the way that we get this film community getting bigger and getting out and doing stuff. And by meeting people is by going out to these little events that have already established. Sato has been going on for ever mm -hmm. and you're going to meet a ton of people and they're all a ton of fun and you'll learn a lot out of it. Um, Sam, thank you so much <laughs> My pleasure. for being on yeah. here and I can't wait to hear what you got coming up in the future. Yeah. In your next big I, feature film. I can't wait to hear what's coming on in the future. <laughs> <laughs> well, take care, man. Thank you. And uh, stay in touch. All right. Thank you. Appreciate it. You have been listening to the Bravo Creative Podcast. Analysis of your biometrics have been compiled and calculated. You are now a minuscule part of the collective. Enjoy the rest of your pitiful day.